Good afternoon, and I'm Diane Sayre, the LaRouche candidate from the slate of six so far in the state of New Jersey, introducing our live webcast with Mr. LaRouche. Also connected via Skype, we have Keisha Rogers and and all of Keisha's supporters gathered in Houston, Texas. Uh, hello, Keisha. And without further ado, I will let you go immediately to Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Well, good afternoon. And let's hope it is a good afternoon. Uh, the main thing is we're virtually on the edge of a global thermonuclear war. Unless action is taken tantamount to the removal of President Barack Obama from office in the near future. It probably will be the case that the launching of this thermonuclear war, which will mean the full capability of the submarine fleet of the United States in the Pacific and other regions, which will be a ex extermination warfare, and Russia is prepared, and probably China too, to react on the instant that they see the launches occurring from the United States and British forces, which means there is some question as to how much of the human species and the nations of the world will survive that event. Now, that event is probably now it was scheduled for an earlier time, but people, uh, responsible people in our military had blocked the launching of this war. Others had been blocking it, but it's still on. And Obama, as long as Obama remains president of the United States, it is likely that this or something like it may occur soon. We're talking about the month of March something in the month of March. It could be later. These things are not certain. What is certain is that the British Empire and President Obama are committed to this action. It can be stopped from within the United States. Other circumstances could stop it, but we're on the urge of its happening. Now, at the same time, the trans Pacific, transatlantic region of the world is in a breakdown crisis. We have a hyperinflationary accumulation of worthless money. Huh? And we are at the edge where all of that money may be canceled in general back, background at any time. Now, there are only two remedies for the threat, the economic threat to the transatlantic region, including the people of the United States. Now, on the one hand, we are, we are faced with the immediate worthlessness of all the bailout money, which means that the only way we can save the United States from an imminent collapse, that is, complete total breakdown where money becomes worthless, and a similar situation exists in, in Europe at this time. Now, the only way we can stop that is with Glass-Steagall. The emergency inaction of Glass-Steagall will save the United States from an immediate collapse. If Glass-Steagall is not installed immediately in this period, we're approaching the point where all of Europe, or at least all of West, Western and Central Europe, and the United States are simultaneously on the verge of a general breakdown where money is toilet paper. That's the situation. The debts of the United States, the debts of the U.S. government, the debts of the European government can never be paid. The stuff is worthless, is totally arbitrary. Therefore, if we apply Glass-Steagall in the United States, we'll force the same kind of action in Europe. That action of a Glass-Steagall action by the governments of the Europe and the United States and other places will stop the crisis. It will not solve the problem. It will stop the crisis. Right? Now, what has to be done then is we have to also change our banking system in general. 
we can say we can stabilize the situation with Glass-Steagall. Without Glass-Steagall, the economic situation of the United States and its people is hopeless. Hopeless. There are no alternatives to Glass-Steagall. They don't exist. And Europe is in a similar situation, especially continental Europe and central and western Europe, are about to collapse. It's just a matter of how long can they hold it off. But the collapse is here. The assets of the Federal Reserve System are worthless. They could never be paid. And this happened mostly since late 19, uh, 2008. We're now in a hopeless situation. But Glass-Steagall, by canceling the obligations of debts which are in the, not in the, uh, in, the, in the responsibility of the U.S. government traditionally, by going back to Glass-Steagall, we could prevent a collapse. But we could not cause a genuine recovery by that means. What we need, apart from worthless kinds of investments, which is now characteristic, if we go to large projects which include uh, the development of NUAPA, that is the famous NUAPA system which was killed when Jack Kennedy was killed, because Kennedy was moving in the direction of the endorsement of Glass-Steagall. That would have been 14 million jobs. We have similar kinds of projects which are waiting. We need the credit system which can do that job, give those jobs, real jobs, not the make-work jobs. And that's possible. And the United States could do it. All we have to do, Glass-Steagall liberates us to do something, but the, we cannot have sufficient funding of these projects on the basis of the funds available after a Glass-Steagall purge, which means we have to go to a credit system, which is in, in our Constitution originally anyway, and that system means that we have the possibility of a normal, full-scale recovery based on large-scale large jobs like Nawapa. I mean, 14 million people jobs just for that, with other jobs coming out of that, which means we can start a general recovery. There are other programs of similar effect, and if they instituted, we can start a general recovery of the United States immediately. It won't be sweet and, and pleasant all at once, but we will be safe, and we will be recovering, and the desperation that we face now will not exist. Uh, this, so those are the options. We have on the one hand, the British monarchy is, go, is going for this thing, and the British monarchy owns the president of the United States. That's a fact. It's not a debate. That's a fact. And so by dealing with these problems, we then create the, we create the kind of situation we need. We're going to have co-op. Under these circumstances, we'll have cooperation from Russia, from China, from India, and from other countries in Asia, and other countries in other parts of the world. And we can start to think about a, a genuine rebuilding of the economy of the world. And that's before us. We also have a wonderful opportunity really before us, which is being killed by Obama and the British. We are, the United States was about, about ready to start a process of developing the moon, which would lead into about two generations or less, perhaps, into the man's beginning to colonize Mars. The colonization of Mars is a feasible conception. There are difficulties which would have to be dealt with before reaching that point. We have, say, one to two, one and a half or two generations to wait to prepare for that kind of job. We already have, scientifically, the capability to transport a human being, say, from either Mars or professionally from the moon itself, to Mars, and we can do that in about a week. We now have the technology, which is not yet developed, but it exists as a scientific capability. We have the capability. So somewhere between a generation and a half or two generations, that mankind can reach travel from Earth, Moon, to Mars in one week. We have that technology. It's, not, it's there. It's scientifically there. It has to be developed but we have time to do it. We also have a problem. Mars, the Mars trip is not just a junket. It's not just a stunt. We have threats to humanity, like one, something that nearly happened but didn't happen, that in large bodies, like asteroids, large asteroids, if they hit in the Earth, hit the Earth, 
can either destroy most of the human population or all of it. This is a threat. So therefore we have, in addition to the accomplishment of traveling to Mars, we have the, also the challenge of preparing to defend life on Earth, human life in particular on Earth, from something that will sooner or later hit. So we need to develop the space program as a program of defense. Now the defense, be, if, you, if you go out far enough, say toward the direction of Jupiter or the direction of Saturn or something like that, you go out far enough, you can actually alter the motion of one of these asteroids if it's about to hit Earth. And you can, a, a relatively minimal amount of effort would be sufficient to do that. But we need to have a system which detects and enables us to deploy means to defend the existence of human life on Earth from this kind of process. We also have the possibility of some of the greatest things that could be done by mankind will be done. Man, and and that, that's something I could get into otherwise. But the point is to make the point. We have two, the alternative. We have before us the greatest disaster that humanity has ever conceived of. That's the one side. That's the Obama side. We also have at the same time the option of mobilizing our economy with the kind of projects we used to admire in our, in our national policy under Franklin Roosevelt and still under Jack Kennedy. These, these, this is our choice. Obama is death. The British monarchy is death. A return to our tradition as Americans, our United States, our cooperation with powerful nations such as Russia, China, India, so forth, Japan, Korea, our nations ready to cooperate with us in these kinds of projects. We have a choice. Under Obama, you have no choice. None. And the time you have to make the choice between Obama and what he represents hmm, is now a probably a matter of a few weeks, maybe a few months. But we're on that point. So this is not a normal election. We have four Republican clowns, and they are clowns. None of them, you know, one of them is, has a few good ideas. The other three have no good ideas. You, so you had a choice between Obama and this bunch of clowns, to be to speak frankly, hmm? and it's up to us to choose which. If we can mobilize sufficient support for opposition, we can remove Obama from office because he's clinically insane. His insanity is well known and diagnosed. Put him out of office under the Section 4 of the 25th Amendment. That can be done, but it must be done soon. In that case, then, since the Republicans are clowns at this time, all the candidates are clowns, not all Republicans are clowns, there are many some, some good ones out there, but the, the candidates are no damn good. And therefore, what we have to do is we get Obama out and then pick a, an appropriate presidential team as the candidacy, and we have a new prospect. We have the prospect of survival. We can get cooperation. The United States can get cooperation if it reaches for it. We can get cooperation from nations in Europe which are desperate, because, like Greece. They're desperate. We can get cooperation from Russia, which has great projects, technological projects, ready to go. From China, 1.4 billion people. From India, 1.1 billion people. From Japan, which has a certainly good high technology capability which we can benefit from. From Korea. From other nations. We can reestablish the notion of a system of nation states in cooperation with great pro projects of common interest. That's before us. But we must get, move this population of ours. We must get these citizens of ours out from underneath demoralization. We have great projects, including all kinds of scientific projects, which are there for us. Restore NASA. Restore some of these programs that have been shut down by this, under this president. And we can open up a new hope for mankind in general as well as for our own nation. 
The question is, do we have the guts and determination to do that, at least that much? If we do, we can win. Are our fellow citizens ready to save their own lives and the United States? Are they ready to make that change? Can they drop their cowardice, which we're exhibiting right now? That's where we stand. As I've indicated, we have some of the greatest opportunities, science-driven opportunities, the greatest opportunities that mankind has ever had before, or we have despair. And the target will be that one day, as of now, on one day, when exactly, we don't know, but probably knowing th- the way things are, if Put a president or prospective president Putin is elected. I don't think the British Obama will let him survive. And the way that will happen is you take you just think of all these weapons, these new thermonuclear weapons, just those in the, in the U.S. Navy capability. Do you have any idea what that capability is? Do you not consider what happens if, if they intend to do that? Now the military, our military is re- resisting that, resisting it strongly. The question is, their resistance going to be effective against a president of the United States who's trying to ram this through? That's our problem. So we have, we have the option of removing this guy from office, preventing the launching of an uh, attack on Russia, China, and other nations of Asia, which would be the, probably the full naval fleet, the submarine fleet, with its capability. The minute that fleet launches those warheads in the direction of Russia, China, etc., at that moment, Russia and China will respond by putting its own warheads into operation, thermonuclear warheads. Do you know what that means? That's what you face. At the same time, you face it at, 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 at a moment, any moment now. Somebody will suddenly say, hey, all that debt we have from bailout, we can't pay it. Then money becomes worthless. What happens to the citizens of the United States when they discover the money which is denominated in their names as a possession is worthless? What about the citizens who will still vote for Obama? What's wrong with their heads? What about those citizens that will vote for these four characters for presidential candidate on the Republican side? Are we going to be fools and still play along with the so-called accepted candidates? What would be so easy simply by getting Obama out because of his mental deficiency, the fact that the fourth, section four of the 25th Amendment would remove him from office, which would mean you could put in a good choice of Democratic candidate and don't worry about the four Republican clowns. There are good Republicans out there, but they're not running for office. So we can pull together a good part of the American voting establishment to make a better choice. We can pick on projects like Nawapa. We can put into motion 14 million productive jobs, not make-up work jobs, but productive jobs, including high technology jobs. We have other things we can do and must do to add to that. We can launch the greatest recovery pro- program the United States has ever imagined. We have that within our potential, if the will there exists to do that. But if we sit there and wait for what comes out of an Obama administration versus four Republican incompetents, this nation hasn't got a chance. So this is an election campaign like no election campaign you've ever seen before in the United States. Election campaign to save civilization from a thermonuclear war which would, by its very nature, would mean that sometime this year, before the next election, a great part of the human population would be extinct. Are we going to still be clowns 
and play the game the way somebody wants us to play the game? Or do we have the courage, the commitment, and the insight to do what you can in this audience, these two audiences, what you can make as a change with the help of your fellow citizens to make a change in the destiny of the United States and the destiny of the planet? This is an election time like no election time you've ever seen before. And the question is, there are enough Americans out there, enough citizens, who have the guts and perception to recognize that they must constitute themselves as a majority, which is going to ensure, among other things, the safety of the United States, the safety of our people, the safety of the world, and the recovery of our nation. That's for me. So we want to thank Glenn for those comments and um, want to start from here with some discussion. And we'll go back and forth. Um, we'll start here with the question from Mr. LaRouche here, and then Diane will take a question from New Jersey there. So first question, go ahead. Uh, hello, Mr. LaRouche. You've been making the point in your recent publications about the uh, you referenced Shelley, Percy Shelley, as someone who made the point that you can't really be free unless you first know what you need to be freed from. Uh, and you've been making the point also that what we need to be freed from is the oligarchical principle. But it seems like what the discovery of the oligarchical principle is to discover really how much it permeates society, how much society is permeated how much the oligarchical principle permeates society and how much it, it's, it, it's in us, it, it's around us, it permeates discussions, it creeps up in, uh, it creeps up in, in the, it's all over the place. It creeps up, so, creeps up in the uh, in discussions just, you know, everywhere all the time. So how do we make the discovery of how much it's actually a controlling factor, um, in, you know, inside of us and also, it's not just something objective, but it's something that it's also permeating within personalities, attitudes, discussions and so forth. Most Americans have no idea what it is. They're not, they're not convinced. They don't, they don't believe in the oligarchical principle. They're, to, they're told that, it, that, that that's a myth. It doesn't exist. Most Americans don't know what really goes on politically in the mind of Americans. What, what Americans are taught to believe in is fairy stories they're told to keep them quiet. They're told that benefits potentially exist which don't exist. They're told that there's a good intention on the part of President Obama. There is no good intention on the part of President Obama. Not much on among the Republican candidates. At least three of them have no good intention toward the United States. No, what fools people is they don't be, are not aware of what they're supporting. They deny it. They say, oh, that would not happen. I know that you could have, say, after the day after the election of the future president of Russia, the day after that, you could have a thermonuclear war on this planet. How many Americans believe that? That's a fact. There are people, including people in our D Defense Department, who are opposing such a war. But most Americans don't even know about it. They will deny that what is actually about to happen to them. They'll say, that couldn't be true. How do you think they voted for this guy, Obama? If they had known what he was, and he's been nothing but very bad news increasingly ever since he was inaugurated, and he was going to be that from the time he was inaugurated, how many Americans know they were voting for a fascist or the equivalent or a mental case? Did they? They saw his health care policies. How did they react to the fact of seeing his health care policies? There's no difference between his health care policies and those introduced by Adolf Hitler. Exactly the same. How many people responded to that? Some people were very angry about the cuts in health care. What about the other programs? 
We sit there and we see our nation being destroyed and our people being destroyed, their lives being destroyed, their health care being destroyed, their jobs being destroyed, their cities being destroyed. And they sit there and they still debate which of these two sets of clowns, Obama and this, these four Republicans, and they sit there like this, they're going to choose between those two things or among those things. No, the American is not aware in general of what he's tolerating. He's hoping that it's not bad. When the evidence is, it is very bad. What about the bailout? What about the cancellation of Glass-Steagall? How many, what is the suffering of the United States brought about under two Bushes? Well, actually three, but two Bushes more recently. Two Bush sessions and an Obama session. Hmm? It's like all these years, a dozen years. And Americans have not awakened to the fact that these Republicans and this Democrat and those three Democrats, presidents, and they haven't reacted, they still are thinking about voting for this, these clowns? That's the weakness. The technique of dictatorship is lies and intimidating people into believing those lies. What's needed, the, everyone knows about poverty in the United States today. Everyone knows how things are becoming worse. Why aren't they reacting? Well, it's true that probably a dozen percent of the total voting population or potentially voting population in the United States is all that it really supports Obama. So why he's the putative victor? Because people are not responding to reality. They're not facing reality. They don't have leaders they have confidence in. They say, well, this, the, next, the next batch will be just as bad as the, as the existing batch or the previous batch. We've lost it. So the, the point is we've got to find people among us, which will be a small minority initially, of ordinary citizens of various ranks and influences. And they will start a movement, which is what we need, is a, the beginning of a mass movement between now and the coming election and pro, hopefully before the next crisis. And that we will be able to mobilize around a core, an initial core of people who are the natural leadership within the population, a force which decides no, no. And there are people in institutions, powerful institutions, people in the Congress who are acting like they, it's disgusting what they're doing, but they know better. Huh? Other people, who ordinary citizens, who know better, but are saying, what difference does it make? It's going to be bad anyway. Uh, why do we have to go out and do anything about it? They're demoralized, they're discouraged. Ever since Jack Kennedy was murdered, there's been a decline in the American citizen's confidence in his, his own power as a citizen. Things have become generally, with few exceptions, worse and worse. I mean, this is not my generation of World War II. This is not the generation that we knew with, with Eisenhower and with, and with Kennedy, or Bobby Kennedy, who was about to become president if they hadn't assassinated him. And, and uh, you know, th that's our situation. We're now in a point of alarm. And we've got to do two things. We've got to continue to insist on recognizing what the danger is. But we also have to emphasize strongly what the alternatives are which are within our reach to present. We've got to get, make our fellow citizens more confident of their own powers. We've got to give them a spirit of optimism about what they can accomplish. If we don't, I can assure you, we're on the verge of a potential near extinction or an actual extinction of human beings. This can happen. The conditions for that exist. There are courageous people in leading positions in our government and in other governments people of great influence in other, in other kinds. These people are actually trying to move something in the direction 
of preventing these horrors from happening. There's a lot of evidence of that. You can pick it up even from some of the press. But if we don't, if we continue to say we accept these four Republicans as legitimate candidates and accept Obama for re-election, we are finished. And the question is, what can we do to make sure we're doing what we should do to mobilize our fellow citizens to change the climate? And it won't take much. It will start small, and it must spread fast. Okay, so now we're going to take a question from New Jersey, and I'm a little surprised. I think New Jersey has been, I don't know, cowed by Texas? Normally, New Jersey and New Yorkers are a lot more aggressive, but uh, <laughs> all right, here comes somebody now. Please say your name and where you're from. Yeah, I'm Ken Sanderson from Ithaca, New York. <clears throat> Hi, Lynn. It feels like I know you really, really personally, although I'm looking at you great distances through uh, time and mechanisms. <laughs> but uh, coming from Ithaca, I'm trying to uh, pose this question because I want to say something. <clears throat> i got to represent Ithaca. Nobody else is here. And I have a memory of mine at Johnson Museum at Cornell University in a presentation by Maurice Hinchy at the time of the Yugoslavia fiasco some years ago, in which he gave a very good presentation about the matters, not intending to take a really strong stand against it, but he made a very good case and reported the history and in the context of the Treaty of Westphalia, and he kept making mistakes. And I kept nudging him because I was sitting front and center just a few feet from him. And he accepted those corrections graciously, and went on to make a good presentation. Then there was a question asked from a member of the audience, um, when was this treaty? And he didn't know. He said, oh, gee, like 1,200. So I told him, you know, we're talking 1648. Remember the Hundred Years' War, the Thirty Years' War? Oh, yes, thank you very much. Now, at the end of that meeting, uh, questions. He never would call on me, typically. I and Jenny Cobb were there. He, he accepted my uh, question for the first question. So I praised him for the speech and I said, Mr. Hinchy, suddenly I changed. I said, can we discuss Lyndon LaRouche? He immediately said, oh, I'm not capable and immediately began looking through the crowd for somebody else. And unfortunately, we didn't get a follow-up to, to, to you know, make that happen as was in that audience that day. So what I'm looking at now now, as I'm saying, what can I go back to Ithaca with? I'm here now, and they're going to know that I'm here. And I need to go back to Ithaca with a message from the top, if you will. <laughs> I, th I think things are clearer now. Well, I got black blackballed, you know, early on from some of the things I did. I'm very proud of the things I did. But the other side, I was pinned, you know, designated as being a danger to them or danger to the people they wanted to please. And there, I've never had much of a problem in recognition among leading circles in Europe or the United States or even elsewhere, some other places. But the, the, all, the friendly communication between me and these kinds of officials was always off the, off the uh, obvious agenda. It was on the sidelines. It was on yes, this, yes, that. Of course, you're right. Yes, but you are too. You are too dangerous. We don't want to be involved, because there was this. It happened particularly. Remember the the assassinate. What happened under Truman, after Roosevelt's death, the guts went out of many of the citizens, especially the politicians of the United States. The the assassination of Kennedy, people learned their lesson. That was not, you know. That assassination of Kennedy was official, was really an official killing for an official purpose. Kennedy had two things that against, or three things, 
First of all, you remember he was backed by Eleanor Roosevelt, who sponsored him. And he agreed to serve her conscience in respect to Franklin Roosevelt's intention for the post-war world. And he carried out that protector. How well or not, I don't know. But he did a good job as president while he still lived. But again, he's assassinated. You got cover up. This clown didn't, didn't kill Kennedy. There's four other guys who came from, front, from Spain as part of the operation which was out to kill De Gaulle. They came into Mexico. They crossed the border from Mexico into Dallas. And they, they riflemen, expert riflemen, assassins, shot him and were gone before anybody knew who had done what to whom. Then we had a cover-up of that assassination. As a result of that, the guts went out of the American population. They said, our presidents are killed. Well, Bobby Kennedy was, was killed. Why was he killed? Because he was the brother of John Kennedy. Hmm? So what in this country, and I've had this, you know, in my position, I'm exposed to this discussion often and have been for decades. You want to do this. We will not let you do this. Now the time has come when what they tried to do with blackmailing me is, doesn't work. It doesn't work anymore. I'm on the front page. And I'm saying things which I know to be true. I have no fear that there's any wrong in it. I know the situation is coming down. The American people know the system stinks. They know their lives are threatened, at least economically and otherwise. Their health care is threatened. Everything is threatened. Everything is being taken away. And they know something must change. But the problem is, you, in a case like this, someone has to stand up who has the basis for credibility, as I do, and say, let's do it. Let's do it. I'm almost 90 years old, but I'm in fairly good condition right now. And I'm prepared to deliver the job. I know I'm right, and I know I have many friends in various other governments around the world, powerful friends in these various governments, including the United States. And the time has come for us to take over. And to take over how? By mobilizing our fellow citizens to do what they know in their conscience will be the right thing to do. take the next question from Texas here. I want to say hello to New Jersey. Thank you all for joining us. Hi, Lynn. <laughs> okay. Um, come on down. Uh-oh. Diane, you scared them. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, my name is James. I live in Katy, Texas, which is on the edge of Houston. Um, and this is the first time I've really been learning about uh, the movement with my friend Beverly V here. So um, I've, I've got a good orientation from today's speakers, um, including why impeaching Obama would change things. What now I don't get is why you guys call it the British Empire system. And if you can just summarize that without you know, boring, everybody else already knows all that. I, 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 okay. That's it. Okay. Pardon, the, the world has generally been under an imperial system. It's called a monetarist system. Now, we, we are so used to believing in money as being value, which it is not. It is an assigned value, assigned by forces which are called the oligarchical system. And various countries, have been, for example, the Roman Empire was the first major multinational imperial system of that type. It collapsed from intrinsic reasons. Uh, then you have the Byzantine Empire came along as the Roman Empire successor. And that went down the same way. 
Then you had the, uh, the system of chivalry, which was a Venetian system. Then you had a new Venetian system later, uh, which became the British Empire. So what you had is a system of money. Money is an artificial authority which is imposed upon people. Now, the, alter- the alternative to a monetary system is a credit system. The first credit system, which you would know in the United States, was established in Massachusetts as the Massachusetts Bay Colony, in which the, the state, before it was crushed by the British, the state of Massachusetts, or the colonies it was called, set up a credit system where the, where the government of Massachusetts would authorize credit in place of money for projects based on the estimate that this project was going to work out. Now, we are now faced with a similar kind of problem. We, our monetary system is bankrupt. Our money system presently is hopelessly bankrupt. Glass-Steagall will eliminate that problem. However, it will, what it will save in terms of, of banking systems and credit systems will be minimal. Therefore, we need a system which provides credit. We had a, such a system in the post immediate following the, the victory of the United States in the Revolutionary War. We had the same thing was done in, under Lincoln, where the greenback system, which was a federal credit system, which was authorized to get us through that mess. We've had the same kind of effort has been done by under other presidents. President Franklin Roosevelt, with his introduction of Glass-Steagall, was moving largely in that direction. Today, Glass-Steagall would not be sufficient to save the U.S. economy. It would, stop the, it would stop the blood flow right now. But what we need is a credit system. For example, let's take, uh, let's take NOAPA. NOAPA once started, and it can be started very soon, 14 million jobs, high-tech jobs largely, with a lot of jobs in there that are not just necessarily high-tech. It, it, it will also need a new railway system, new kind of railway system for the United States and other major projects, water projects, everything. So this will create up to 20 million jobs. And 20 million real jobs in the United States today would be a real turnaround. And with that kind of turnaround creates a byproduct. When you create productive jobs that produce physical wealth, those jobs lead to other jobs, which are byproducts of the major projects. So we need a system of credit under which we don't just pass money out, new money, new credit, but we consider, under private circumstances or government programs, we consider those methods which are likely to succeed and be beneficial. And therefore, we allow government credit to fund the people who are going to be employed in these kinds of projects and use the materials. That, that kind of program now, which was what Roosevelt was aiming at in the 1930s, that kind of program now, would be sufficient even under present conditions to start the United States on a genuine recovery program. We don't need to borrow other people's money. That is the money, artificial money owned by banking systems, these kinds of speculative banking systems. What we need is a system of credit which allocates credit for what is needed to be done and where government coordinates this process to make sure that where the credit is given is given for a project which is worthy of consideration. And thus, by simply doing that amount in, a, in the public sector and the related to the public sector, we create enough fall-off in additional employment to make the economy function in what we would think is a normal way. It's just that simple. We don't need bailout. We, we can't get rid of this bailout money. It's fake. It's only a gambling money. We need a currency which in the form of official government-controlled currency, which is shared out with private interests and other interests according to the government's judgment that this is a worthy, case, worthy cause. We have certain major projects, like NWAPA is typical of that, 14 million jobs right up front, and high-tech jobs in terms of the drive, driver. We, it means, not only that, it means Alaska. Alaska is a great potential for the United States. It's never been realized what its potential is. We're now having a, a change in the climate. The Arctic region is now opening up. And with high technology, we are going to have people work, living in these areas and conducting large projects, including mineral projects, which are of great value to, to the United States. And these are the kinds of things we can do. 
They always were possible. Now, now the need for that is, is crucial. Therefore, what we need is two actions. First of all, Glass-Steagall. Get rid of the garbage. Honest, honest money only. On, honest interest only. Go back to the, our basic system before the, uh, we, we changed to what this, this present system and launch some good projects, which we need. We need badly. Look, for example, look at the harvest. We're going into a period this spring where under the present U.S. government programs, there is going to be a massive food shortage throughout the United States. This food shortage is caused by things like Monsanto and other things, other, other swindlers who've imposed an in, a way of control of, of, of crops, which is clinically insane and murderous. So therefore, we need these kinds of reforms. We need, to, we need these right now. Come spring, come the next planning time. If we haven't done something about this, we're going to have people dying in the United States. Look what's happening in Texas. Look what's happening in the whole that region on food supply. The cattle business. How are we going to make up for that loss of cattle and feeding our people, our, our crops? We, so therefore, it comes to the time that we need that. And we have on the rec books of our nation, we have the system, define the system, which does the job we need done. Okay, New Jersey's next. Now we're getting a line. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Also, I was going to suggest, why don't we put a chair there so people can wait so we know there's an empty chair behind the mic. Okay. <laughs> what? Ahead. I know who you are. I think Lynn knows who you are. Tell the people in Texas who you are. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, good afternoon, Mr. LaRouche. Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Jessica White. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. And I have a couple of things to say that um, you probably already know about, but I think everybody here might be a little surprised. To kind of, remember the surprise thing? Kind of surprised me, too. So um, give me a minute. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, February 15th, the official voting body of the United Federation of Teachers, uh, we stood at 661 delegates that night. They voted by an overwhelming majority to support the reinstatement of the 1933 original Glass-Steagall Act. That's giving okay. me the good education. <laughs> I, I start grinning every time I think about it. I, I was elated. I was ecstatic. I was like, you know, is the Glass-Steagall lady here is what they said, you know. And it's, it's really amazing. It's amazing. It's, so the thing is that we worked on this for over two years to get this through and just kept hammering away at them. We would show up, myself and, and Bob Obrick, would show up at uh, executive board meetings and give our little three minutes, and then they cut it down to two, and we'd stand up and say, no, you said three, you know. <laughs> and um, so now it's like this is the culmination of something that we've been really working for. And then I thought about it a minute, and I said, okay. The thing is that we've had so much opposition to this, and then now that we get to this point, ain't We've had people that were totally against us, like Mel Aronson, the treasurer of the UFT, totally against it. Then we get to this point and we get this overwhelming majority. It's like, you know, I know my harassment is working, but come on now. So I'm thinking uh, they know about impeachment. They know that we know that impeachment is necessary. I've talked about impeachment again to executive board members who looked at me in surprise, you know. So uh, I think they, besides really understanding that this is necessary, some of them really do. But besides that, they also would rather have this than impeachment. So when, they, when we get up and say to the 661 delegates, now we really need impeachment, okay, we did Glass-Steagall, impeachment now, now is next. 
then they'll really be scared. Okay. So what's next? We have so many different organizations that they actually listed as uh, getting on board with this. They talked about the AFT, who um, they're going to also pull in on this. Well, they were in it in the first place, you know. So my question is, is uh, what, what next besides, you know, the usual harassment, okay? <laughs> what you need is you're talking about a spark to ignite a movement. Uh, that's what it amounts to. If, if, you, if you can break through, and as you know, teachers, for example, especially in areas where the teaching standards were higher earlier in an earlier time, you had, the New York system used to be a very good system. Right? And therefore, the legacy of that what once good system, uh, like a certain city, a city, you know, city college, uh, was a center of that kind of thing. That was the conception of it. So we had, we had still then a ne- demand for high degrees of skills of various kinds in the New- greater New York area, in- into other parts of the area, Connecticut and so forth, upstate New York. All these things were coming out of this. So you had a high morale because people respected themselves. Who, those who can do a good job and have a chance to do it and a chance to get, develop the skills to do it, develop a high degree of confidence in themselves as persons, as citizens as well. And they tend to be the spark plugs, which will bring up the level of confidence and skill among people who are less fortunate in terms of their circumstances. And that was the case. At one point in New York City, before it was changed by the violent change that occurred there, was a, still a center in which there was a very strong kind of pride of achievement. That has now been largely smashed, but there are some of us who are old enough to remember a time that it did work and remember those times, remember what was possible then, and said, we can do it again. I think that's our answer to this thing. Okay, so I think we have a question here. Hi, my name is Adnan Bader from Dallas, Texas. I'm visiting my brother over here in Houston, but I heard about this meeting. So I, I have a question for you about the, what's going on in the Middle East. Uh, basically, you know, the Arab Spring, or what's called the Arab Spring, and uh, what do you think is a, is a driving force behind, other than the corrupt governments, or what we think that's, you know, people are striking against corrupt governments, there must be a bigger strike force behind the movements in the Middle East. And what I'm talking about, what I'm asking about particularly, is a country like Syria, which is what's going on right now in there, where you see like basically American planes and uh, Russian aircraft carriers and submarines in the, in the Mediterranean Sea, and uh, the relationship of what's going on in there and what's going on with us in here in our government. So I just want to hear some ideas from you. Well, first of all, we, we've known the thing, for example, what happened in uh, the little event in New York City, Al-Qaeda's event, uh, is still there. Now, Al-Qaeda is now working for the U.S. government under the current president of the United States against Syria. And the whole thing there is there's an attempt to reduce the world's population from the level of what it is now to 7 billion, 7 billion people, to less than one. It's a British policy. So, first of all, there's an intention to reduce the human population down from 7 billion people to 1 billion people. That's a stated policy. That is the policy of President Obama, who takes his orders from London on this one. That's what the Green Movement is, largely. That's what many people have just fooled into this thing. But this is an extinction, an extermination kind of event. Look at the food policies. Look at food policies. Look at health care policy. What is happening to health care policies under Obama? What has happened to food supply under Obama? What has happened to jobs under Obama? What has happened to all these things that we depended upon under Obama? And where are the orders coming from? From London. What, what runs the whole area of the so-called Middle East? The whole area has been run since the end of the 19th century 
has been run by the British. What happened with the Turkish operation? Huh? The whole operation run by British intelligence. And all of these nations are being set against each other to kill each other. Take the case of the Iraq War, the Second Iraq War, which I'm sort of an expert on, because I was one of the spokesmen to prevent it from occurring. There was no basis, no legitimate basis for the United States to become engaged in the Second Iraq War. None. The evidence was fraudulent. Look for the whole region. Don't look at the issue of one nation by a time. They're played against each other. What happened in Egypt, for example? They're played against each other. And they're played by what? They're played by the British, largely, in that region. But you have a U.S. president who's of the same temperament. Then you've got the worst of the world. What happened to Obama, to Libya? What happened to Gaddafi? Gaddafi was Gaddafi. Good or bad, that does not an issue. What happened to Tunisia? What's happened in Egypt? What's going to happen to all these countries? They're all condemned. It's hell. And we need a United States, which is, owns its own nation, because we are potentially a reasonable power on this planet. We have a good constitution, even though we abuse it. Hmm? And we can be a good factor. Today, we, we can have cooperation with China, excellent cooperation with China. We can have excellent cooperation with the gov government of, of Russia today. They've got many problems. They've also got some good projects which we need to share. China, and China is, has, is, is really, in a sense, it has problems too. But it's developing, it's growing, it's improving. Other, we have a peaceful situation in Korea now, a stabilized situation in Korea. We have potential cooperation from Japan. We have all kinds of opportunities. And people are destroying this. They're destroying the civilization. It's the old imperial game. And the Arab world is is a prime target. You get one billion Arabs or the equivalent, of Muslims or the equivalent. And they're all, they're all being targeted to play against each other in these kinds of fights. I mean, I know these countries. I know Iraq, or I used to. I know Turkey. I know Syria. These countries are being systematically destroyed. And I know that if we, the United States, had a president who was a really a U.S. president, not some kind of a stooge or a dummy, that we, with our power and our influence and our opportunities for cooperation with other nations, we could do a great deal to bring this nonsense to an end. And forget the British game. Forget the British angles. We don't need a British ally. We need the U.S. allied with itself and with a lot of other nations in the world who recognize that our goodwill, our goodwill is important to them. And we have to maintain that thing that sustains that sense of goodwill in our cooperation with them. Around the nation today, we can't have war anymore in general. We may have police actions and so forth which do involve military force. But the idea of general and prolonged warfare is a piece of insanity. Look, we enter the age with World War II of nuclear weapons. We, by, the, by the end of the 1960s, we had entered thermonuclear weapons. We have progressed now to a higher order of thermonuclear weapons, an area which I'm somewhat familiar, that is some of the principles involved in this thing. I was, I was the author of the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. It was my project. I pushed it. I got a lot of support. We could have won. But now today, we can no longer have general warfare among major powers. Because when you get to the point of the thermonuclear weapons, of the type that our Navy submarines deploy today as, a, as the principal function, they can unload on a notice. They can load enough power to extinguish whole sections of large nations in one shot. We've not re we have, and we have conflicting powers which have that capability. The United States has the greatest one still. 
But these are extermination wars. We have to find out ways to control these kinds of problems without going to thermonuclear warfare. Because thermonuclear warfare is capable by itself of causing an extinction of the human species or something near to that. And that's the problem we have to deal with. If we, I, the fear right now is under British intention and a British stooge called President Obama, we're on the threshold of a thermonuclear war under which the British and the United States will launch from submarines thermonuclear barrages which end to exterminate the targeted nation. The minute that's done, and it's known that the, the things are lifted off, then Russia, China, and other countries will launch counter thrusts to make sure that the nation that attacked them does not survive. That's what you're dealing with. That's what's true this year. That's what's true right now. That's been what's been true ever since they killed Gaddafi. He, he was captured and they killed him as a captive because they didn't want a long trial of him as a former president of the country. So they exterminated him when he was a captive, their captive. And it was done on the orders of President Obama. This is the kind of world we're living in right now. This is the kind of world that has to be changed right now. And it won't be changed under these candidates you aren't looking at now. The four Republicans are not going to do a damn thing about it. No. The Democrats under Obama are not going to do a damn thing about it. They're going to cause it. Obama is threatening to do it under British orders. And as long as we don't see these things clearly and act to correct them and act to eliminate from office the kinds of presidential power that would authorize and launch this kind of thing, we're finished. We don't have much of a choice. We have one choice. Get these bums out of office and replace them with some that are real. Hmm? Here in New Jersey, please say your name and where you're from. Yes, good afternoon, Diane. Uh, my name is Fran McLean, and I'm a retired registered nurse, and I live in East Orange, New Jersey. And I just have a question regarding our so-called health care system here in the United States. The job that I recently retired from, I was a home care nurse in New York City, and I just wonder about the number of hospitals that have been closing around the country, especially in the urban area where I've worked in New York City, you had the closure of uh, St. Vincent's Hospital, which was operational for about 160 years. Yep. And with me living in New Jersey, we've had approximately five or six hospitals closed within the Newark, East Orange and Orange area. The type of job that I just retired from was a home care agency, and I'd noticed You've had all of these so-called home care agencies spring up that have people in these managed care programs. Yep. And what I hear from a lot of my colleagues who were former RNs in the hospitals, that a lot of things that were hospital-based are now being pushed into the home where families and these nurses' aides are taking care of people within the home. Mm -hmm. And I don't expect experience, I saw that a lot of these people were not experienced enough, and there were a lot of crises that I myself would find, had to call 911, et cetera, when I used to see, especially a lot of elderly people. The other thing that my friends and I noticed was that um, these people that are pushed into these home care programs, everybody has some type of other diagnosis. Let's say if they were being treated for diabetes, it's got all these other comorbidities that are not necessarily true. And a lot of my elderly patients were on uh, some type of psychotropic drug or sedative, you know, what, what people would call. Yeah. And you would see that within some period of time, these people eventually 
died. So I, I'd like to have your comment on this. Well, being 90 years of age, almost, you know, I have some feelings about this kind of thing. And not only, not only some feelings about these kinds of things. I, I got to get there. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I remember how the great reform happened in, in New York City. Huh? Back in the 1970s, right? In which this whole so-called great reform of New York City... What was wrong with New York City, as you probably recall then from your background, is that we, did, we had an excellent system of industry in New York City. We also had a Pennsylvania railroad system, some other railroad systems that passed through there. We had an organization around rail and truck and whatnot, which is great. We had built up a system of health care support and mass transportation and so forth, which had its problems. Huh? But it, was, it worked. Now, the problem was it didn't have enough income to sustain the city because the kind of jobs which the city required by its design were not being brought in. There were various reasons for, were given for that. You know? But the shutting down of the railway track system going through the New York area into northern New Jersey you know? and think about all those railroad lines that were shut down I had some experience with that thing because I was a, got into involved as a consultant into some of these matters back then. And this was a re- great swindle, destroy New York City, turn it into some kind of a paradise for the super rich you know, and not for people anymore. So we had, we had the greatest capability in the New York City area in terms of skilled manpower. So look now what's happened. The people who were the skilled manpower back in the 1960s and 1970s, they're past it now. They don't do those jobs anymore, and they didn't have them for a long time. So we destroyed a, a city, the greater New York City area, which was one of the keystones of the entire economy of the United States. It was a threshold which t- took care of everything. And it's to be destroyed. We're going to have to rebuild the United States, taking into account these kinds of things. And obviously, if we don't do that, what what our sister referred to, if we don't do that, we're not going to have a health care system because the health care system was based on what New York City could sustain, sustain. We shut down what it could sustain and therefore, we cut back on the means that we use to be able to supply for health care, education, and so forth. We're going to have to rebuild it. We're going to rebuild it on a new basis. But the principles, the moral principles of the education system, the health care system, and so forth of New York City, which is one of the best in the world, with all its problems, it delivered the job. It delivered the job better than most other parts of the world. We're going to have to rebuild it. It's the only solution. There is no other solution. Rebuild it. Good. Hello, uh, <clears throat> my name is Ken Castleman. I'm a retired NASA engineer, and I have a question about the space program. I used to work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we always felt that we got more bang for the buck in space exploration with unmanned uh, craft than uh, the manned program got because for a few million dollars, we could build a robot and send it to Venus or Mars or uh, send it to the outer planets, and it would take pictures and make measurements and send back data. And we didn't have to send all that life support equipment with it, and uh, we didn't have to bring it back. Whereas in the manned space program, the missions are much more expensive because you have to keep humans alive and you have to bring them back. Um, <laughs> I remember one of, the, one of the scientists told me one day after Voyager uh, had its encounter with Saturn, he said, we learned more about the outer solar system this afternoon than in all previous time. And uh, so... So my question is, what do you see as the role 
I've heard what you uh, have said about the manned space program of uh, reactivating that and of uh, colonizing the moon and eventually Mars. So I would be interested to hear where you think the unmanned space program fits into all of this, particularly in the area of the advancement of science. Yes, it's a very important area, part of the area, and I think it is largely misunderstood. Because for, for every man we ever put into space, we're going to put hundreds of units into space for all kinds of purposes. You cannot send man even into the near parts of the solar system, up to Mars and Jupiter, that area. You, can't, you cannot do that without a tremendous deployment of all kinds of instruments. For example, let's, let's take the instrument in the Bad Island belt, belt around the United States, <laughs> around, around Earth. The, what that involves. We, we're, now, we're now just beginning to realize fully the implication of what the Van Allen Belt area reads, means. We are now, we, that's the area where we put most of our flying instruments around Earth itself. If you want our instruments up there, someplace where they're convenient, fairly stable, to function for weather and other kinds of systems, you do it. As we go into space, in deeper into space, we're going to have more things under management at remote control than the world could ever imagine right now. And what you're going to have is probably a colonization essentially on the moon in tunnels developed in, in the moon as a base of operation. We may do some direct shoots of man's craft into Mars or into the moons of Mars <clears throat> and return, hopefully. <laughs> but what we're going to mainly do, for example, we have to set up a system of protection of planet Earth in particular, against large rocks and things like that, which if they hit the Earth can exterminate pretty much most of the human civilization, it, not all of it. That can be done. But that means we've got to place these observing instruments out there, and then we've got to set the instruments there, which can be deployed, to cause a what might hit Earth to be diverted from an Earth collision point. We have many other kinds of investigation required. We're getting into a, a change in the galactic system. Now, we're not going to send people on visits to the uh, galactic system right now, but we're in part of, part of the galactic system. We're having a change in the sun's characteristics and in the other kinds of so-called weather characteristics. We're going into a phase which the human species has never experienced in its own lifetime, several million years of history. And we're going to have to deal with those problems. We're going to have to create artificial environments to protect man against a kind of weather in the solar system which we've, we as a human species have never experienced before. We're going into a much higher risk area, which means we're going to put more of the kind of apparatus you're talking about into place than we are people. We're going to put people in there as a controlling mechanism for setting up these systems. That will be our initial scientific research program and so forth. And man is the most efficient science re scientific research institute. It can use human judgment. Instruments do not have creative judgment. Instruments have response capability. And we can create pretty good response capabilities as in terms of instruments. So it's going to mean largely a proliferation of precisely the kind of instruments that the Obama administration is shutting down around the United States in terms of weather systems and things in orbital systems. We, we, we don't know the weather anymore. We don't have control over the weather anymore. We lost it. Obama killed it. It wasn't too good then, but Obama killed it. So that's where it belongs. We are going to have to find that mankind is going to learn when we get to matter-antimatter impulsion. It means we're bringing into capability a controlled mechanism over the outer rim of the solar system. And that's something we have to have in mind. We have an immediate area within the uh, Jupiter area and inward. We have other kinds of problems, such as defense of Earth against things flying through. So, and plus all the instrumentation. There's so many things we don't know. And we know how to develop the instruments that can tell us, uh, enable us to discover things that we don't know. So you're going to have the unmanned craft are going to vastly outnumber all the manned craft. But the manned, manned role is ne necessary to make the whole thing work. We have to essentially, because only mankind 
is creative. Instruments are not creative. And where creativity is required, you have to have mankind. At least we don't know any other species of instrument or living being which is capable of human creativity. And therefore, some people will be going into these areas to solve problems that only human creativity can solve. But you're right. The major area of responsibility must be return to the instrumentation of nearby space from which we get all the things we need. We need a decent weather system. We don't have one. and We're not going to have one until we get some more objects in space that do that kind of thing. We don't even have the systems we had before because Obama shut them down in terms of around Earth itself, in Earth orbit, in the Van Allen Belt region. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jerry Halloran from Quincy, Massachusetts. And, and uh, I had a couple of questions. Well, I heard just recently, uh, yesterday, about some, um, I think they're U.S. government uh, bonds that were found in a Swiss bank that were um, forgeries, uh, so to speak. Uh, they may have been written by Goldman Sachs, but they're organized crime figures. I guess the same thing. But um, <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't tell where they came from or where they were going, but then maybe, uh, I don't know, Maybe they were headed to Merkel's pockets and she was going to pawn them off to Greece or something. But one of the other questions was, um, you know, if that was true or not, I'm not sure. You know, because some, some order of like trillions of dollars in these bonds. I don't know if you heard about that. But, but the, uh, the other thing I heard recently was um, about the loan of the nuclear arsenal to the British. Uh, is that true? I mean, how is it, I mean, the, the Lend-Lease policy during World War II ended at the end of the war, right? I mean, how long are we going to arm the British and, you know, are they going to use them on us at a certain point? I mean, but what I really want to ask you was about, um, I was reading uh, oh, some time ago, at least a year ago, in uh, IBEW Journal, you know, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, about the decline in the, uh, the um, high tension wire, you know, the men that, that service these high tension wires, some of them from helicopters because they're so high and, and they're so remote that, you know, carry power systems and, and communication systems also. But the, for the most part, you know, the older guys that are retiring and the, the younger guys aren't being trained. So we're losing that, that capability, that skilled labor. And not only, not only in that field, but, you know, like, like you mentioned, you know, in the uh, auto sector, the machine tool sector, aeronautics and so forth. But I want you, you know, to comment on that and, you know, how, how we, you know, at this point, if we ever did get to, um, well, hopefully, you know, soon to, to uh, uh, building the WAPA, you know, deploying, you know, millions of people, uh, where would we find that skilled labor? You know, if we have it, do we still have it here in this country? We have a, on, this, on the WAPA project, as a perfect example of the area you're talking about, is uh, NWAPA has not changed in some respects too much since it was designed by that company at the time that Jack Kennedy was president. And the, there's some question about how much Jack was directly involved in the WAPA, but certainly uh, the people around him were. And that was, a, that was an intended project which uh, Johnson had under his, uh, President Johnson had under his uh, wing at that time. And the WAPA would mean much more now than it meant then. Because we have things in, in Russia and other parts of the world which are developing in related ways. We now know that the, we've got to explore and do things about the Arctic region that we didn't know we had to do back then. We also know that the Antarctic region is highly interesting from a scientific standpoint and it involves many problems we have to master. We're getting into a whole new thing in the area of Antarctica, a great lake hidden underneath this whole system. So the world has changed. Now Russia's doing a lot. We, they're having a melt of the ice area, because not because it was getting warmer, but because the, the ice was accumulating because it was not getting into the ocean enough. So now the thing is opening up, and there are whole areas up there which are significant for all kinds of scientific reasons and physical reasons. So we are going to go into that area. We're going to find, uh, we're going to find a lot of these kinds of projects. And they will be among the major drivers. For example, when you do NOAPA, as installed in the WAPA, 
You have things to go with it. You have to get reactivate Detroit, Michigan, you know, go down into Ohio, Indiana, so Illinois, out to that area. And you're going to have to develop the whole, you're going to have to develop a mass transit system. What are you going to really have? You're going to have a, a, a high-speed mass transit system. Hmm? This is going to re, 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 give rebirth to what used to be the automobile in, in related industry. So when you start with a 14 million man job, assignment on the Moffat strict, add some of the about two million more jobs of a similar kind of skill, and then go into the auxiliaries that, that you have to get into also because you're developing the United States. I mean, for example, we need more better we need a whole system of water management for the United States. We're undergoing presently a change in the character of weather, a change which is actually determined in the galaxy, not just something nearby. And we're going to have to deal with that, that kind of problem. We're also going to have much more in terms of earthquakes and similar kinds of phenomena. So we're going to have to develop new systems to deal with these kinds of problems. That is, the universe is changing. The gal galaxy is changing. The solar system is changing. The weather is changing radically. And mankind under a high-technology driver is capable of developing the kinds of protection and other assistance which is needed to deal with these changes. So that's so we're talking about really going to thermonuclear power as a driver for economy. And we're going to be using tech kinds of technologies which today most people don't know. We're going actually into matter antimatter reactions, which will become in the near future a very significant part of our operations. So we are we, and it will be important for us. So these things are all coming on. Uh, there are challenges. The possibilities for mankind's improvement, improvement of our capabilities, are enormous. We, what we, the, our major problem is to develop the human beings who have not been educated or have not been given motivations which are productive motivations over the recent decades. We have two to three decades of shrinking. Since the assassination of Kennedy, we've had a shrinking of the productive capabilities of the U.S. population, the intellectual potential of our population has been declining as a result of this. So we're going to take the opportunities we have, I think, or I would do it if I live long enough or if I can convince others who succeed me to do that. We're going to take our shot on taking what the best things are that we can do which will lead to this general transportation, transformation. And that's the way we do it. It's the way we did it in the past, but this time we have a lot a higher technology, more power than we ever had before in terms of systems. So we have before us a great opportunity. The years ahead for this generation are still going to be tough. But if we're talking about two generations ahead, the possibility for mankind is magnificent. Good afternoon, Linda Narush. I'm Beverly D. from Houston, Texas, and I want to thank you and acknowledge you for all the education that I've received from your websites and from your pamphlets. And, uh, and I just want to acknowledge you for what you're bringing to us as far as information and truth. So my question is, what do you want us to do? What actions do you, could we take to further this mission? Give us a new presidency who's human in intention as well as in biology, mm. and someone who has understanding and create, a, create in our political system, create a system which is thinking about the kinds of things I've been t responding to here today. We, the things that we are not doing as a nation, which we should be doing and could be doing. I mean, you know, life, people think of life, you know, I die, I born and die. I don't think that way. I think the point is we will die, we will all die, even me eventually. <laughs> Those, some enemies will not like that. But the point is we, can, we, can, we should adopt objectives which we make possible as achievements of those who succeed us. We must focus on those things which are most essential for mankind's role in the universe in particular, on behalf of mankind, the development of mankind. We have to live our lives 
with the intention of when we have died, we will have set into motion for the coming two generations to be born the kind of mission which they, in turn, can muster themselves to accomplish. We have to think of ourselves as immortal in the sense that our life, the benefit which we contribute with our lifetime, will not die, but will continue in the progress of mankind after us. And it's when we can see ourselves as living in a nation which believes in that and acts that way that I can sleep peacefully knowing you're in safe hands. Good. We'll come back to te uh, New Jersey here, next in line. Please. Uh, my name is uh, Donald Adams. I'm uh, from New York. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. LaRouche. Uh, Thank you. I just wanted to say that Everything that we want to do uh, has to be predicated on the removal of Obama from office. And uh, without, without this happening, uh, nothing else is going to happen except destruction. Some of us may think that uh, because of, uh, uh, we have the capability to go ahead and uh, uh, launch uh, missiles uh, at Russia and uh, China, that, that, that solves the problem for us. No, it doesn't. It may start the problem for us. <laughs> Years ago, the Russian uh, made a, mob, a very, very large nuclear bomb. The, the amount of material that was enclosed in that bomb was uh, small compared to the results that happened. So that the actual uh, explosion took in the, uh, the atmosphere itself. So very easily, uh, this could happen uh, all over the world. The atmosphere is, is, is the fuel for it. So that's the end of civilization, the mm. end of the world. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But we have to go ahead and realize that as, as people, we believe that we don't have any power to go ahead and all to uh, the events that are here. Uh, I went online, and I have a daughter in Toledo, Ohio, and uh, she is uh, uh, a very religious person, and she has people around her that are very religious people. And um, so I put the, uh, I said, uh, go ahead and go on to the LaRouche uh, website, and go on the uh, thing about the, uh, the thermonuclear war. So I was on Facebook. So I then look at Facebook and the people around uh, her uh, that went on Facebook about the same time were saying, well, what would, what would you do if you knew that uh, you would uh, have um, uh, a nuclear war this morning? And they said, well, they would pray. Now, that, that would be the reaction. In other words, the re reaction is that they were beyond the ability to go ahead and do anything. They would pray. So you have to overcome the, the mindset that people don't have any power to do anything. So we have to think about what we are going to do to go ahead and influence the powers that be to have Obama removed. I think they ought to, the people of that problem ought to read uh, the Apostle Paul's writings on these matters. The question is, we have a responsibility to act. Whatever the problem is, we as instruments have the responsibility to take appropriate action to tr protect mankind and to preserve the meaning of mankind's life. We have to be an instrument of the Creator, not an observer. And that's the only solution. Because, I mean, people don't have a, such a lousy attitude about immortality. First of all, settle the fact that we're all going to die. And since I'm on the verge of 90 years of age, I'm quite aware of that. Um, we're all going to die. 
The question is, what is the consequences of our having lived? What have we contributed when it was needed uh, to life, to mankind's purpose and existence? We're not passive observers. We have to be a responsible agents of the good. Whatever is good, if we can do it, we have to do it. It makes our life meaningful. You can die in pride rather than shame that you've done your job. You've done what was needed, when it was needed, and where it was needed. And the developing of the ability and commitment to do that is the only thing we can really count on personally. We can count on the fact that we belong to the skein of things that are going to come. And we have a permanent place in that skein of development. And so we can die in peace and happiness, knowing that we have lived what is called the good life. And that's a life of service to those who come after us. Hi, Mr. LaRouche. My question is, um, the recent assault on, oh, I'm Justin Edwards from Spring, it's uh, north of Houston. Um, with the recent assault of our, our privacy and the government invasion of our privacy with passing laws like the Patriot Act, National Defense Act, and all that kind of stuff, how do we go back and, and repeal all that if uh, the current president as well as the other four presidents that are coming in aren't uh, going to be sufficient enough to do any of that. We don't have people in Congress enough in order to turn those around. Well, you've got a bunch of cowards there at the Congress. But, that's, but there, there is a way of thinking about this which I believe works. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of garbage which has been adopted as law in recent times. And it becomes more and more reckless because the politicians become opportunists they got a bunch of constituents who's going to help them get reelected or something of that sort, and they will do something for that constituent or that constituency. And we look at this aggregation of absolute nonsense which is piled up as law under these circumstances. That's because congressmen don't have a sense of moral responsibility in the way that they, some of them used to consider themselves responsible for that sort of thing. It, it's all a racket. It's a racket called the success game in politics. And we should be operating from a sense of a mission orientation, which should essentially be a sort of, not a simple consensus, but a growing process of understanding what mistakes we've made, what has to be done for the future. Not for yourself as such. Yes, relief for those who need relief. But for, essentially for the future. That's a mission. Like they take, take the case of Nawapa. It's a perfect case. Huh? It will take probably 30 years, at least according to the original design, to complete the Nawapa project. Huh? That's not bad because in the meantime, all the things we'll be building as part of what is the completed Nawapa project huh, will all be good things during the process of the development. Hmm? And we've got things now that we didn't have then when the WAPA program was, was put up for uh, in, in, back in the middle of the 1960s. It's much better now. And the things that go beyond it. So we are, in a sense, we are participating or should be participating in a process of development of the conditions of life on Earth, hmm? all kinds of conditions, so that we're making the Earth and living on it better. We're also dealing with the problems of the, of the solar system, which we now have to deal with because we have problems up there that are coming down on us. We're sitting here on Earth waiting for some of these things to come down on us. We have the power with nuclear power and thermonuclear power. We have the ability to intervene in that process and protect Earth. We can protect Earth, maybe not perfectly, but we can do better. And so this mission orientation to eliminate things that were nonsense. And a lot of legislation that was enacted was nonsense. For example, Monsanto's control of grain. 
Monsanto should not have control of grain. Grain is a living process, which was invented by the whole process of evolution of life on Earth. It was not invented by Monsanto. Grain was invented by the by process of development of Earth. And it was not done by human beings, because the whole process was started long before human beings came along. So therefore, our job is to get done what we know is, must be done to improve the conditions of, uh, on Earth and of Earth. That's our general, and of mankind in particular, are the education of people of mankind. Well, people today don't have decent education. Our educational system is horrible relative to what it was 20 years ago, 40 years ago. It's horrible. The schools are worse than ever before. The curriculum is worse than ever before. You have a shrinking percentile of the total population in science and other things which are actually competent. And the others, not to say because they're in, they are incompetent, but the process by which they're educated and the way they are employed is incompetent. So that's the problem we face. We have, we have practicing political garbage by our government. We don't have real government leadership. And look, when, when Jack Kennedy was killed, when he was murdered, and we didn't do anything about it, we invented Oswald not to do what was to be done by those foreign agencies which came into, into Mexico and across the border into Texas to kill Kennedy because they didn't like his space program. They didn't like his, refu above all, they didn't like the idea that Kennedy was blocking a long Indochina war of 10 years which ruined much of the United States. He was killed because some people didn't like his policy of high-tech development a space program, you know, and his op opposition to endless wars abroad. He was supported in this, of course, by General Douglas MacArthur and by Dwight Eisenhower, both of whom knew that we, the United States must not find itself entrapped into long wars in Asia. And the United States was trapped to the assassination of Kennedy, to the fact that nobody wanted to go deal with that problem, publicly, and the fact that these institutions allowed themselves to be dragged into long wars in Asia and elsewhere. Well, you, we are, what we're doing now to the military abroad in, in Asia now, these war, long wars, perpetual wars, you take people who went into military service trying to get break, a break in life. They went out to do military service as National Guardsmen or things like that. They, found they went out once. They went back, went out again. They went out again. They became crippled and so forth in the sense of futility of life in perpetual war in Asia. And we have, we've done that to our people. And most of the problems that occur today are among the younger generations, actually three generations in terms of birth, Take the the children who are born. You know, when I came back from war, what happened? What happened to them? What happened to their children? What happened to their children? What's the condition of emotional and intellectual life among our citizens through these three generations? Those who are born when I came back from war. The generation that followed that, the, the baby boomer generation, as such, and now the new young generation. Look at the conditions of life, of, of mental life and emotional life and economic life of the younger generation, of those who were born 25, 30 years ago. What's happening on the streets? What's happening in Arizona? And these, this, this aspect of life is the moral aspect of life which we have to concentrate as a moral guide to what is a decent behavior by government in shaping the conditions of life of our people. Okay, so we are going to take one last question, which is from here, and then uh, we will wrap up. <laughs> Go ahead. 
Good afternoon, Mr. LaRouche. My name is Robert Bobrick. Um, I want to reference uh, one of the previous speakers, Jessica White, on the uh, Glass-Steagall, uh, the victory in the UFT on the Glass-Steagall uh, resolution. And I think you said something that, uh, in answer to her question, that was uh, very important. You said uh, this could be a spark. So um, maybe I had an intimation of, uh, of this. So the next day after the resolution was passed, I went to the uh, Chelsea Reform Democratic Club in Midtown Manhattan, which I think you may be familiar with from your days in, in that, uh, in that uh, borough. So, uh, and I said to them, well, I'm from the UFT, and uh, they passed a resolution on Glass-Steagall. Maybe I, uh, I propose that you and this club uh, do a similar resolution. And then uh, I said also... Uh, couldn't we have a choice for president in the Democratic Party? Why do we have to have just one candidate? Now, I want to digress here a second and say that my uh, music uh, director at church often tells us uh, the silence is as important as the notes. <laughs> so keep in the music and remember that, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't move when the piece ends. And... What I experienced there was uh, after I uh, spoke on Glass-Steagall and made that comment about a, another candidate for president, there was silence. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I don't yes. know if I was worried uh, because the next thing, or I didn't have a chance to really be worried about it because the, the president of the club who had just been elected, uh, he said, well, uh, maybe we should have a forum on Glass-Steagall. And uh, he asked for hands. Well, not too many hands went up. It wasn't an overwhelming majority like our vote in the UFT, but enough hands. He said, it looks like there are enough people here so that we can do that. So uh, I just want to know, um, you know, what's the, next, uh, what's the next spark? Where do we go from here? I think uh, we have opportunities right now. Okay, the, the problem is, is to, uh, to, to be faced, is the challenge of what does it mean? What, does it, what is the change? For example, we're now eliminating, remember this was 98, right? when this repeal of Rice Siegel was enacted. We have been going into hell ever since that happened. The protection of Roosevelt's Glass-Steagall action saved the United States, and the minute it was removed, within two years, we were on the road to hell. I fought against this thing with the Homeowners and Bank Protection Act in 2007, which I posted up, and which collected a good deal of support around the nation. And then they went against it. That was 2007, August 2007, into September. The next year, about a year later, the bailout started. And there's not much left of the United States economy since the bailout started. We have absolutely no value in that money. The Federal Reserve System is more than bankrupt. It is bankrupt dead. And the similar thing is true in Europe, in the continent of Europe. The nations of Europe, like Greece, are dead because they have a debt which is enormous and never will be repaid. That debt does not represent any asset at all. And Glass-Steagall is simply a measure now of saving the nation from the Wall Street operation, which is killing the United States. So therefore, there are two things that are required. We need Glass-Steagall to save what can be saved of the banking system. That is the commercial banking system. Because we, we have to save as much as we can rescue and say... To, the, to Wall Street, Greg, the gamblers, look, that's your bet. That's your gambling system. We do not subject our banks, in which our people's savings are entrusted on similar kinds of assets, we do not risk these institutions for your gambling practices. Now, that, the problem is now that we have ruined so much, especially since 2008, the ruin of the United States and Europe since 2008 is unbelievable. 
There is no value in those banking systems right now. So we can salvage some of that by saying, okay, that which cost is classified as a commercial banking system under Glass-Steagall, we're going to protect it. The federal government is going to protect that thing. This stuff is your, is your business, buddy, your gambling racket. We don't cover it anymore. Well, that means a lot of these things have collapsed. But you can't help it. They're all bankrupt. They're worthless. You cannot actually give value to something that is worthless. So then we have to, we need now something in addition to Glass-Steagall. We need to go to a credit system, which was the original system of the United States, of, of national, national banking, which is, the, in other words, the federal government becomes a supplier of credit through the banking system and under government law for creating investment capabilities as public investment, pe- public credit, for useful purposes. That worked. Later, they canceled that, they canceled national, national government, and then we, we've been into a collapse system mode ever since. So we have to return ourselves now to a public credit system, as a federal credit system of the type that was actually enacted in our Constitution. Because, in, you know, when we finished the war of liberation, independence, war of independence, we found that we were essentially bankrupt because the banks of the United States, which had funded the defense of the North America against the British occupation, now found themselves with debts they didn't know how they were going to pay. So now, under, our, under the Constitution, as formed at that point, we provided for a national credit system under which the federal government would make federal credit guarantees on behalf of the U.S. government in terms of these commercial banks. So we saved the commercial banks by federal credit and it enabled us also to use, create more credit for large-scale investments, improvements, public improvements, as they were called in those days. And through that time, we did it. The, what we have to do now is get free of the British system, which is what the matter is, and go back to a public credit system and protect commercial banks. As, as Alexander Hamilton, as Treasury of the Secretary, acted in his time to get public credit for investment in agriculture, industry, transportation, and all that sort of thing. And that's how we built, built, we took the public investment and became the source of wealth, which we paid off the debts of the commercial banking system. And we have to do the same thing today. Just go back to that. And that's what really what, this, what Glass-Steagall is. Go back to separate the phony banks from the real banks, the commercial banks. Keep them in good order under good management, under good law, but then use the federal government's credit for funding large projects or other kinds of projects uh, which are beneficial to the U.S. economy and people. So therefore, you now are capable of making much larger investments, scale of investments, than you could with a mere commercial banking system. If the, if the projects are, are selected well, if they're well-funded, then you have an improvement. And that right now is our only hope of recovery. So that's what really what Glass-Steagall means. It's a necessary first step to restoring a system of public credit. And under a system of public credit so restored, we have everything open to us. And as everything that from there on is how smart we are and how few mistakes we can make. So I want to thank Mr. LaRouche uh, for those excellent comments. Uh, Thank New Jersey for joining us. Um, I think we have been given a great mission as stewards of the earth and the upward developments of our galaxy for mankind. This is a great mission for everyone to be participating in and that we must People must join our fight in this. This is what is the existence of our nation, of our republic. And so, as Diane said, we have a slate of congressional candidates. We are representing the institution of the presidency, the real presidency, what any presidential candidate would be calling for right now. Mr. LaRouche has just laid out that platform, and we've been laying them out at our various meetings. Uh, Today, here with me, I also have... Congressional candidate Summer Shields, who is also a part of our national slate of six congressional candidates who will be speaking later. And so we've been given a great mission. 
and it's a more beautiful mission than what we're seeing coming out of the insanity of Obama and his British puppets. And so we should crush this British empire once and for all, and we should move to the great mission and progress that is in store for mankind. So thank you very much for joining us. Remember, support the LaRouche Slate, the LaRouche PAC activities, contribute to our activities. Uh, we have our slate of six congressional candidates, and they are leading the charge and taking the reins of leadership. Thank you.